Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And um, yeah, this is a very special joy and privilege for Judy, my wife, and I to be here with you this morning. Uh, it's a special day in the life of uh, Montreal and his life's Grace Church. Uh, as uh, Pastor uh, Joseph mentioned, uh, we're going to have a um, called installation of Pastor Wu Hao as a senior pastor of the church. I'm explaining more a bit about that after the message. We're going to look at the Word of God first and then have a special time of a challenge and prayer for your pastor. So, um, but in, in uh, thinking about this, the message for this morning, um, I wanted to, uh, to challenge all of us in the area of the call to ministry. And that's the title of the message, Call to Ministry. As you know, the church is a living organism. It is not, we talk about the church, the building, as a church, but that's not the church. It's just not an organization uh, structured with, for the government or with rules or whatever. We sometimes call that church. But the church, ah, a little bit higher, a little better, that way? Okay, <laughs> good. But the church is made up of people who are who've experienced the grace of God and who want to know God more. It's more than just a social club, a self-help gathering, a humanitarian organization, even though the church helps people, we help each other, uh, we do good things as a church. It's that. But the church is a community of believers who meet together to discern the will of God in their lives in the lives of their community, and join with God in his plan to reach the nations with the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the church. And when someone puts their trust and faith in Jesus Christ, they not only receive eternal life and the presence of Christ in their lives and the Holy Spirit who blesses them, we receive all those blessings when we become saved and when we become born again and put our faith in Christ. But at the same time, we become part of a family called the Church of Jesus Christ. It's His Church. Well, we talk about Grace Church, we talk Lion Church, and Baptist Church, and those kind of things, but altogether, it is the Church of Jesus Christ. It's His Church. And Scriptures teach clearly that we're not to live our Christian life in isolation, all alone, but in community, relating one with another. And we are to live out our faith in a practical way in relationship with people. But it isn't through the church, in and through the church, that we learn how to grow as Christians. We learn who God is, all about his love for us, as we teach and pray and encourage and support one another. So we're going to look at the church and the call to ministry in the church. And the next slide is our Bible reading this morning. So if you have your, uh, I believe it's up on the screen as well. (laughs) <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. And we're going to take a few minutes to look at that text. <clears throat> so Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness 
of Christ. This is a very important text. Scripture text that reveals a lot about what the church is and our role in the church and the place that we can have in that church. And we see several key important truths about ministry in the church here. So the first one is the call. Next slide. The call. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. We'll be looking at the text. The verses will not come back up. So if you have your text there, I'll read them. But, but verse 1 it says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Live a life worthy of the calling you've received. The call. But this is not any kind of call. This is a call from Jesus Christ himself. It is he who calls us to minister in his church. You see, followers of Christ, Christians, if you're a Christian, means you're a follower of Christ. We are called to a higher standard of living. As followers of Christ, we're to imitate Christ in his life. So like, for example, honesty, integrity, grace, respect, love, compassion, or should be common characteristics of all those who claim to be followers of Christ. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, in answer to the question, somebody asked him the question, he said, what is the most important thing we're supposed to do? A believer, someone who follows the Lord God, what is the most important thing we should do? The most important commandment. Are you familiar with Jesus' answer? He said the most important commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. That's powerful. We are called to a higher standard. So pastor, who how? You've been called, you received and answered God's call to the ministry years ago. And over the years you responded to that call and confirmed in different churches by different people. A number of years ago, about three or four years ago, you responded to the call to come to Grace Chinese Church as pastor of the Chinese congregation. And now you're being called to serve the church, this church, as senior pastor. This call has been confirmed by the fellow ministers of the Alliance in Quebec. It's a call that's been confirmed by the leadership of this church and by the members of this church. The call from the Lord to minister. This particular call moving from, and it's, we got to be careful, huh? We can, do not see Pastor how how who is as um, oh oh boy now he's got a, a promotion okay oh, he was pastor here now he's pastor of this and oh, it's a promotion in the church it's not a promotion we're all ministering together we all minister together responsibilities change authority and all those kind of things go with it. But it's not like in the world where, oh boy, now I was pastor of a small church, now I'm pastor of a big church. It's a promotion kind of thing. No, we're all in it together. And his responsibility is now increased. (laughs) It will be increasing because that goes with that area of responsibility. But remember, when God calls, he also equips. He provides everything you need. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Do you get that? There's nothing missing. There's nothing missing. Everything is there. Philippians chapter 4. Next one. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. How many of your needs? All. Nothing missing. When God calls, he equips. And he'll give everything you need. 
But when we talk about the call to ministry, often we, we think just of a pastor, right? Or a missionary who's sent off or they're responding to God's call, right? Pastor, well, he's been called to this. Pastor Joseph, been called to that. Somebody goes off in missions work, they're called and they respond. The call to ministry, folks, is for each one of us. Each one who is a follower of Christ has been called to minister in his church. This is just not for the pastor or some special person who is spiritually whatever, doing whatever. It is for everyone. If you're a follower of Christ, he has called you to minister in his church. Verse 7, chapter 4, verse 7 that we read. What does it say? But to each one of us, grace has been given. We've all been called to ministry. And this ministry is defined as a work of grace. Often we associate grace with salvation. That's true. We're saved by grace. But the context here in chapter 4 is referring to the gifts or the gifts that Christ has given to his church and refers to them as an act of grace. Why? Because we receive these the call, we receive the equipment to minister, we receive the opportunity to minister because it's a work of grace in our lives. I do not merit. I cannot merit or earn a certain ministry on my own strength. It comes from Christ. Just like I cannot earn salvation, I do not earn or merit a certain ministry position in the church. Yes, we respond to it. We have to take care of that call. But the call to ministry is not your call. It's not your ministry, I mean. It's not your ministry. Everything we have, who we are, what we do is because of his grace towards us. And he has called each one of us to minister in his church. That means each one of you. No exception. There is no exception. And in his grace, the Lord created you with personality. He's given you experience, uh, qualities, capabilities, um, giftedness. And he invites you. Not just pastor, but each one of us to be involved in what he wants to accomplish in and through his church. First Peter chapter 4. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received. There it is again. Each. Each of you have received a gift of grace from God to minister in his church. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Some ministries are similar to others. Some are different. But everyone has a place in ministry in Christ's church. Therefore, this exhortation in verse 1, remember that one? I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. That's just not for the pastor. That's for each of us. So, my question for you this morning is, how is your life? How are you living your life? Are you living your life in whatever context that is? Married, single, working, retired, young, old, healthy, not healthy, whatever it is, the life that the Lord has given you. Are you living your life worthy of the calling that you've received? Because that's what it says here. That's the exhortation for each of us. Not just for certain people in the church, but for everyone who identifies as a follower of Christ. We're exhorted and commanded and urged to live a life worthy of that calling. 
You have the answer to that question. May the Holy Spirit guide you as you look at your life in response to this commandment. So, how does one live a life worthy of the call? Well, the answer is in the scripture. There are next verses. Let's look at them. How does one live a life worthy of the call? It's Ephesians verse chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. The first, there's uh, four or five uh, um, ex- uh, commandments or uh, challenges here. The first one, be completely humble. Be completely humble. Pride. Oh, pride. It's a danger for all of us, right? Be proud of what we're doing, who we are, what we have. It's a pride also for those in the ministry, for pastors. Been a pastor for a number of years. It's easy for a pastor to think, oh, well, wait a second. I'm the pastor. I've prayed about this. I was installed as a pastor. I have authority now. I've had Bible training. I've spent time reading this. I know what's right. Why aren't people listening to me? They should. I'm the pastor, right? That's spiritual pride. Spiritual pride. So, Pastor Wu Hao, people will look to you even more now for advice and counsel and direction because of the position of senior pastor. And it's very easy to think that, oh, I guess I am more important. <laughs> but pastors who allow themselves to fall into the trap of spiritual pride end up hurting not only themselves, but also the church. Also the church. But the thing about spiritual pride, it's not just pastors who have that. <laughs> Each one of us has it, or is tempted by it. It can easily fall into spiritual pride. Hey, my ministry? My ministry is a lot more important than her ministry. Hey, I have this ministry. I have this responsibility. And you only have that. Well, hey, you know, hold on. Look who I am. Spiritual pride. Spiritual pride. It can affect all of us, folks. It can affect all of us. And it's deadly. Deadly not for only for the individual. Deadly for the church as it seeks to discern God's will for them. But you see, like I said, it's not your ministry. You have ministry teaching, working with the children, music, uh, maybe uh, helping uh, in the behind the scenes in finance or welcoming people. That's not your ministry. We say it's your ministry, right? My ministry is this, or my ministry is that. But in reality... It is Christ's ministry. He has entrusted you with that ministry to do it for his honor and glory. And we need to keep that before us. It's just not my ministry. It's the ministry that Christ has called me to and he's entrusted me to accomplish it for his honor and glory. True humility, being completely humble, includes confidence or self-confidence in what we're doing. This is different than sinful pride. Confidence is knowing who I am in Christ. It is being confident, not in my strength, but in the knowledge that it is Christ who is working in and through me to accomplish his will. So, Pastor, the Lord has entrusted you with a ministry in this church. So have confidence, not in your strength, not in who you are, but confidence in who Christ is and who he and how he can work through you to accomplish his will. That's mature confidence in the Lord. And again, this is for all of us. This is for all believers, all followers of Christ. Exercise your ministry, whether you're a pastor, musician, or teacher, or finance, or what it, cleaning the, the church, whatever the ministry has given, the Lord has entrusted to you. Accomplish that ministry with humility, but also confidence that it is Christ who is working in and through you for his honor and glory. Number two, be gentle. Kind of goes along with uh, humility, right? Be gentle. 
Some, a church is made up of people. Somebody said that if there's no people, there's no church, and rightly so. If there's no people here this morning. Uh, well, yeah, you'd have a church building, but there'd be no church, right? Uh, because the people makes the church. Church is people. But just like people, the church has its highs and lows, its good times and not so good times, its strengths and weaknesses. A walk that is worthy before God will be marked by humbleness and gentleness and not a desire to push our own agenda, get things done our own way. Pastor, congregation, may you all have the reputation of being known as people who exercise your ministry with gentleness and humility. Number three, be patient. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Whenever I think about patience, I think about the illustration of a man who is praying that God would help him in his personal life, his character. And he prayed for more love. He prayed for compassion. And he says, Oh Lord, please grant me more patience. But right now, uh, you know, he's impatient to be patient. Well, that doesn't work, right? You cannot learn patience in a book. You can't take a course. It's not watching a video that you're going to learn to be patient. How do you learn to be patient? <laughs> it's rubbing shoulders with others. <laughs> it's in the context of being with others is where you learn to be patient. We often want to see things done quickly, the way we think best. It's my idea. Our ideas should, are best. We want to see them done now. But patience is learning to accept God's timing, not mine. And that's not easily done. <laughs> it's learning to trust that God's timing is better than mine. May we all strive to be more and more patient with one another. For that is a sign of living a life that is worthy of the calling you have received. Next one. Bearing one another in love. It goes along with patience. The word bearing, to bear, means to support or sustain. Um, if you've ever done renovations, house renovations, or you want to modify a room or whatever, the very first thing you have to do if you want to move a wall, you say expand a room, right? There's walls and you want to expand and take down a wall and, and make it bigger. The very first thing you do, you have to find an engineer or contractor who's going to look at that wall and he's going to determine, and he knows how, is it a load-bearing wall? That's a term, a load-bearing wall. A load-bearing wall means the wall supports the roof. The roof is sitting on that wall. If you take that wall out, the roof will come down because it bears the weight of the roof. A wall that is not load bearing, you can take it out and the wall and the roof stays there. Why? Because it's not load bearing. It doesn't have the weight of the roof on it. And in a house, some walls are that way, some are not, depending on the construction. Bear one another in love. Support. Sustain. Hold up. Accept others the way they are. Now that's easier said than done. But that also is a life worthy of the calling that we've received. And we accomplish this not in our own strength, but through and with the love of Christ. It's Christ's love in us that allows us to accept others the way they are, to support others. Bearing one another in love means... Allowing others to learn, to practice, to do things in a way different than I would do, to even to make mistakes. Because people have been, have bared with me in love and allowed me to make mistakes. Hey, I'm the person I am today. I sure wasn't that way when I started ministry 20, 30, 40 years ago. People have shown love to me bear with me, and we need to do the same 
with others. Bearing one another in love means that one has the power to take revenge, but chooses not to do so. Think on that one. That was strong. We have the power to take revenge, but I do not. See, every relationship requires bearing, enduring, patience, a marriage, friendship, and even more so in the church. We need to bear one another in love. And so may all of us, pastor, members of the congregation, may you be known as people of faith who support one another in love. And the last one, number five, make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Let's be clear. We do not create unity. You cannot create unity. Unity comes from God through the work of His Holy Spirit drawing us together in His church. But we're called to make every effort to maintain it, to to keep that unity strong. It doesn't come easy. Unity is not the same as uniformity. Uniformity means you're all going to dress like me, you're going to talk like me, you're going to act like me, you're going to decide like this, you're going to do things the way I do it. That's uniformity. Unity means you may do it one way, I may do it another. You may like this, I may like that, but together we have the same common goal of honoring God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and His work reaching the nations for Christ. And we're together in that, humbly, with patience, loving one another, being gentle. As you, as a congregation, with the leadership, the pastor, the elders, though all of you together, as you are faithful in being humble, gentle, and patient, and bearing one another in love, following what is written here in the scripture, you will continue to make progress in keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's a natural outcome of putting into practice what the scriptures teach. So talking about unity of the Spirit, why keep keep the unity? What's important about it? We have this in verse 4 and 5. Ephesians 4, verse 4 and 5. Where it says, all believers are united together. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father. Notice the emphasis here is on the one. Let's read it again. There is one body, one spirit. Just as you're called to one hope, when you're called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. The emphasis is on the unity, the togetherness. Not the diversity. Yeah, there's diversity, but we are together. We are one. And that's why it's so important to maintain that unity of in the Spirit. It's so important to, to work, live a life worthy of the calling. Why? Because we're all in this together. <laughs> we're all in it together. We're part of the body. Different roles, different ministries, but we're all in it together. And this all comes from Christ who gives us in his grace. And then spiritual gifts for building up the body of Christ. Yeah, there it is. Great. Ephesians chapter 4 has a list. We're going to look at that in a minute. has a list of some of the gifts. But that scripture has I, elsewhere in Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Peter chapter 4. There's other uh, gifts that are listed as well. Um, many different gifts that Christ grants to his people. Gifts that are for encouraging, for outreach to the, your community, for ministering, uh, all kinds of different ways we can be involved. A variety of ministries, each one having its place. <clears throat> but in that list, some of those gifts that Christ has accorded to his church in his grace our gifts are, are for the building up of the believers. And that's what we have here. Verse, um, verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up until we've all reached unity in the faith 
in the knowledge of the Son of God, become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. See, Christ has given all kinds of gifts, all kinds of opportunities for ministry. Each one has a place. These particular ones in the area of teaching and leadership, they're, they're, the, the goal there is to, so we all may be built up in maturity and faith in Christ. Next slide. So it's to equip and train believers in their various ministries in order that we may all work together. There's the oneness, the unity, as we grow in our understanding of who Christ is and what he has done for us. So as I started this morning, I said this it's a special time in the life of Grace Church where we recognize and celebrate the call of God and Pastor Wuhao to be senior pastor. And as we do that, and we will have a special time in a, in a few minutes, and as you continue the next days and weeks thinking about that and, and the ministry that the church has, please do not forget, do not forget that each person each one who identifies as a follower of Christ, who is a part of Grace Church, has also been called to minister in his church. Now we have a special time for pastor. We do that. It's kind of our church culture. But that does not minimize in any way the call that each of you have received by Christ to minister in his church so we can work together, building each other up and accomplishing the ministry that God has entrusted to us. Awesome. Christ has called each one of us to ministry in his church. So may we respond by living a life that is worthy of that call. Let's just take a moment for a personal prayer, reflection, a meditation allowing the Holy Spirit to continue teaching, speaking to us in the way that he needs to. Uh, so it's not my words, that would be his words that challenge us to live a life that is worthy of the calling we've received in Christ. So just take a moment or two, and I will close this time in prayer myself. Heavenly Father, thank you for the text that we've been able to look at this morning. It's a text that reminds us, Lord, that you are the one who has called us. You are the one who has saved us, called us by grace to know you and salvation in your name. But you've also called to be part of your family, your church. And you call us, Lord, in your grace to different ministries, different opportunities to exercise a ministry or giftedness in different ways in your church. So, Father, continue by your Holy Spirit revealing your truth allowing each one of us who is here this morning to better understand our place, the call, the ministry that you have for us. Oh Lord, encourage each one to continue to trust you as you've entrusted us with the ministry in your church. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.